Last time on Failed Races, we talked about the Škoda Octavia WRC. And to the 24% of my audience who come from Czechia, yes, I will pronounce it correctly this time. The Czech tank was a peculiar car in the WRC at the time. The Octavia WRC was the biggest car in the championship. It also lacked the innovative features of its competitors. One of its competitors, the Peugeot 206, had a particularly innovative way of meeting the minimum size rule. The road car that the rally car was based on had to reach a minimum length, but Peugeot wanted a short wheelbase to make the car more responsive. Their solution was to homologate a road version of the 206 with massive front and rear bumpers to make the car long enough. Skoda was caught blindsided by how technologically advanced their competitors had been. The Czech tank's simplicity may have helped it in Kenya, but its lack of agility hurt its pace everywhere else. The Octavia WRC may have been a widely loved car thanks to its size, its performance in Kenya, and Roman Cresta's interesting choice when looking for a parking spot, but the World Championship is not a popularity contest. To win the World Rally Championship, you need something more. You need something innovative, something perhaps a little smaller, something with maybe a bit more technology. This is the story of the Škoda Fabia WRC. The Fabia WRC was rumoured to exist for quite some time before its existence was finally confirmed. The 2003 season started and Škoda was still rallying the Octavia in the World Rally Championship. However, by March of 2003, photos of the new Fabia WRC had surfaced. The world knew the Fabia was on its way. The Rally of Germany would see the debut of the new Fabia WRC. Tony Gardemeister, a 1994 world champion Didier Oreo, would enter the rally with a new Fabia, whilst Jan Kopeski would enter with an Octavia. Unfortunately for Škoda, problems would immediately emerge. The anti-lag system had failed for Tony Gardemeister. Didier Oreo also wasn't showing much pace. On stage one, he was 13th. Things would get worse for Škoda too. Oyo's engine wouldn't make it past stage 7, and Gardemeister's drive shaft would break on stage 11. For both Fabias, the rally was over. Only Jan Kopeski in the Octavia would finish the rally, taking 20th place. It seemed that the unreliability of 1999 that affected the Octavia was now coming back for the Fabia in 2003. It wasn't just the unreliability that was the problem. That could just be considered teething problems for the new Fabia. The car was quite clearly still slow. Some of this could be blamed on the team's lack of testing, but the car was still lacking the technology of its rivals. For example, there was still no paddle shift yet, something Škoda's rivals had been using for years at this point. Fans were hoping that Škoda would replace the low-tech approach of the Octavia with a new, high-tech, optimised Fabia but it seemed that they'd actually just brought a miniature Octavia. The Fabia's pace would not improve for the rest of 2003, with the car failing to score a single point. The Fabia's performance was significantly worse than that of the Octavia Evo 3, which scored all of Skorda's 23 points for that year before the Rally of Germany. In fact, the car was so bad in 2003 that Škoda decided not to bother showing up for the first five rounds in 2004. Instead, they used this time to develop an updated version of the Fabia. The new version would be designed in collaboration with Audi, using their wind tunnel to work on the car's aerodynamics. It would also finally adopt paddle shift, using the ring style of paddle shift that was also used by Peugeot. It seemed that Škoda was finally taking the WRC seriously and not just showing up with a tank and finishing 11th. Finally, partway through 2004, 
the Fabia was ready to go. By stage two, both cars were out of the top 10, but it was the gap that mattered more than the position, and Tony Gardemeister was just 15.9 seconds off the lead and ahead of Sebastian Loeb. Schwarz was in 16th, 25 seconds down. The Skoda's pace was finally something other than laughable. Although they weren't on rally leading pace, they weren't expecting to be either. 2004 was just a test season for Skoda, much like 1999 and 2000. Things would change for the Skoda team, however. On stage three, Armin Schwarz's left rear suspension would break. The rough Greek roads weren't doing the Fabia any good. Armin Schwarz would retire from the day. Tony Gardemeister, on the other hand, continued to set reasonable pace, climbing as high as sixth place on the leaderboard thanks to his consistent stage times, but Lightning would strike twice for the Skoda team. Gardemeister's left rear suspension would break on stage 9. It seemed as though Skoda's rally was over, and had this occurred at the previous rally, it would have been. However, the FIA had introduced a new rule at this event called Super Rally Regulations. Cars that retired on one day could rejoin the rally later on. Under current regulations, these cars are eligible to appear on the final results after taking severe time penalties for the stages they miss. However, for 2004, cars restarting on Super Rally rules were excluded from the final results, meaning rejoining under Super Rally rules would only be useful for testing. Luckily for Skoda, testing is exactly why they'd entered the rally. The Fabias would treat the rest of the rally as a test session. The remainder of 2004 was to continue as a season for testing as well. However, in Finland, they would bring three cars. Armin Schwarz wouldn't make a huge impression, finishing 12th, but Tony Gardemeister would finish in 8th, scoring a point, and gravel specialist Jani Parsonen would finish 6th, putting three points to his name. This was a promising result for Skoda. It finally seemed like they had a car that worked, Unfortunately for Skoda, the next rounds wouldn't see a repeat of this. Armin Schwarz did manage to score one point by finishing eighth in France, but that would be Skoda's best result for the rest of the year. For 2005, Skoda would enter the Manufacturers Championship with the Fabia. This was not a test season anymore. This was the Fabia's debut proper. The team would have a very flexible driver lineup for 2005. Eight different drivers would drive for the team. Armin Schwarz would drive in every round except for Sweden, where the DTM champion, who would later go on to win the World Rallycross Championship, Matthias Ekström, would replace him. But it soon turned out that the Fabia wouldn't have an easy year. Come Monte Carlo, and Armin Schwarz would crash out of 13th place. Alex Benge would also retire, but restart under Super Rally rules and fail to score any points. Rally Sweden would see Jane Tuohino briefly reaching the points paying positions before a lack of pace saw him drop out of the top 8 before retiring with suspension issues. Touring car legend and then current DTM champion Matthias Ekström wouldn't make much of an impression for most of the rally either. He finished 10th, but on the second last stage he did manage to place 3rd on the stage classification. In Mexico both cars finished, but well outside the points. In New Zealand Sardinia, Cyprus, Turkey, Greece, Argentina, Finland, and Germany, the car failed to impress. But the Fabia finally saw a mild turn of fortune in the next event. The Rally of Australia 
was a notable rally for the Škoda team, specifically because it marked the return of 1995 world champion Colin McRae. McRae had driven for Škoda previously in the year at the Rally of GB, finishing 7th, but at that time he hadn't driven in a rally since 2003. Now he had some experience back in the car, Colin was ready to get back on the pace. But, despite the Scots credentials, all eyes were on the battle at the front between Loeb, Solberg, Atkinson and Grönholm. All four of them looked to be just as likely to take the lead. The coming 26 stages of the rally looked to bring much excitement to the rally fans of the world. Local star Chris Atkinson was especially impressive on the familiar Western Australian stages, but problems were bubbling under the surface for Subaru's rookie. He felt though the steering didn't feel right. Despite this, he was fastest on stage 3. After stage 3, the top 4 was separated by just 4 seconds. Meanwhile, Colin McRae was all the way down in 13th position. But on stage 4, Colin picked up the pace. He went 2nd fastest on stage 4, elevating up to 6th position. The Fabia was finally showing some genuinely good pace. On stage 7, Chris Atkinson steering would finally fail, costing him huge amounts of time and dropping him from the lead to 13th overall. This was bad news for the local fans who saw an Australian driver drop from the lead to outside the top 10 at his home rally, but it was good news for Colin McRae and Škoda. Colin was up to 5th, meanwhile Loeb had just taken 2nd place dropping Grönholm to 3rd. Grönholm was hoping to get his place back, but it seemed that Peugeot had hired the same people from the 737 MAX production line to assemble their rally cars. Loose bolts on the front right suspension caused it to collapse. Grönholm's rally was over. Colin McRae would finish 4th on stage 7, elevating his overall position to 3rd. Škoda was in a podium position, McRae had unlocked the potential of the Fabia. Francois Duval behind in fourth wouldn't give the 1995 world champion an easy run. Duval had Colin's old car, the Citroen Zara, and the Zara was fast. With one Zara battling Colin McRae for third place, the other was battling Peter Solberg for the lead. Loeb had just taken first place from the Norwegian on stage 8, and on stage 9, he tried to go even faster by taking an alternative line through this corner. Unfortunately, the alternative line didn't help. Loeb retired, leaving Sulberg out in the lead. This would keep McRae on the podium, despite losing a place to Francois Duval. Being on the podium didn't distract the rally legend. He'd been in this position many times before. It didn't matter if he were in a Fabia, a Focus, a Zara or an Impreza. Colin only knew one speed, flat out. The Fabia stunned the spectators as it flew high over the jumps, but despite the spectacular driving of McRae, there was nothing he could do to keep up with the pace of the Citroen. Getting the spot back from Duval seemed like a lost cause, but he was still on the podium. It wouldn't be a mechanically easy time for the Scotsman either. Stage 13 saw the paddle shift system fail forcing McRae to shift using the backup mechanical gear lever. The loss of paddle shift itself only causes a minor loss in pace, but when the system fails, other hydraulic systems in the all-wheel drive system lose their hydraulic pressure and also fail. The result being a car that can be very tricky to drive. Further down the road, Petter Solberg was making good time. His Subaru was fast, but the kangaroo in the road certainly wasn't. The radiator was destroyed, and the engine subsequently failed. Given the performance loss from not having a functioning engine, Solberg retired. McRae, however, would not gain a position, as Harry Rovenpera took second place. Rovenpera would push hard and extend his lead over McRae, but he pushed too hard. Rovenpera spun, handing second back to McRae. This would be a short-lived high point though, Rovenpera continued to push, and on stage 22, took back second place. After the 23rd stage, McRae was in third. Skoda decided to change McRae's gearbox. 
This decision would prove to be disastrous, as the job took longer than expected. Rally teams are given a maximum amount of time to work on their cars, going any longer than that and time penalties will be incurred. Go even longer and you won't be allowed to continue the rally. That's exactly what happened to Colin McRae's Fabia. With only three stages to go, the number 12 Fabia was declared as over time limit. This exceptionally rare type of retirement was the only time McRae was out due to OTL in his long rally career and it was right as he was about to secure Skoda Fabia's first podium. The disappointment was immense, but despite the DNF, McRae showed that the car actually had some potential. It may not have been as fast as the Zara or the Impressa, but it was certainly improving. The following year, Skoda, Mitsubishi, Peugeot and Citroen left the WRC, but the cars from these manufacturers continued to be run by privateer teams. The main privateer team running Skoda Fabius would be an Austrian team called Baumschlag Rally and Racing, entering under the name of Red Bull Skoda. Due to the uncompetitive nature of the Fabia, the car did not see many privateer appearances in the World Championship after 2006, with the car quickly finding its way into national championships. But the Fabia's WRC story didn't end here. Skoda would go back to what they did best, entering in the second class of the World Rally Championship. The Skoda Fabia S2000 used the Mark II Fabia as its basis, but that still used the exact same PQ24 platform as the Fabia Mark I. The Fabia S2000 would go on to become the most successful S2000 car ever. In addition to that, in 2012, a frustrated Sébastien Augier would leave the championship dominating Citroen team to join Volkswagen Motorsport. But the Polo WRC wasn't ready yet, so what did they do? They entered a Fabia S2000 in 2012. Being a lower class car entered into the top category, it was not competitive, but it did give Volkswagen team some much needed experience in rally operations. The following year saw the introduction of the VW Polo WRC, but something seemed awfully familiar about the car. Of course, it was the platform. The VW Polo WRC was based on the Volkswagen Group's PQ25 platform, an update to the platform used in the Mark I Fabia, the basis of the World Rally Car. How did the Polo WRC go? It became the most successful world rally car in history. 83% of rallies that the VW Polo world rally car entered in, it won. It won every constructors and every drivers championship it entered. In the four years it was a part of the world rally championship, it didn't just rewrite the history books, it used the history books as its toilet paper. It wasn't just the Polo that was dominating either. In 2013, the rule set, then known as R5, now known as Rally 2, was implemented. Skoda entered into the R5 class again with their new Fabia, another PQ25 based car. So how did the Fabia R5 go? It went well, very well, as Skoda Fabia won the team's championship in WRC 2 in 2015, 2016, 2017. 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. The new Skoda Fabia RS Rally 2 is yet another innovative and game-changing car. It has new advanced aerodynamics that give it 50% more downforce than its already dominant predecessor and does so more efficiently. It has visibly more grip than any other Rally 2 car. It is an engineering masterpiece. With the Rally 1 regulations set to be rewritten in 2025 to be more similar to the Rally 2 regulations, we may see Skoda come back to the top class soon. And with how good the Fabia is right now, they might finally be a front running contender. The Skoda Fabia WRC may have been a failure on its own, but it was the beginning of a long line highly successful rally cars.